Welcome back, Char Addicts. We have a very special episode today. What I would consider the father of modern retail trading, uh, a pioneer and someone who's always been on the edge of financial technology since before financial technology was even relevant, uh, an individual who pioneered a lot of the technology that we all use today in retail trading, the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Richard Olson joins us today. Great pleasure to be part of your podcast. I really appreciate you stopping by the podcast today. Dr. Olson, for the few folks out there that aren't familiar with you and your story, do you want to give a brief background on who you are? So I I was born in Switzerland, Zurich. I, you know, kind of first studied law, then economics, then started in a bank and then did my first venture, which was building a real time information system using big data before, you know, the concept was known and the idea was to have available real-time forecast from minutes to hours to weeks, like an online weather map. Two things came of that. One thing we did fundamental research, when I mean fundamental research, data-driven big data research published that in scientific journals. That gave rise to a new field, high-frequency finance, and is part of the literature of microstructure, which became part of that. And the spin-off was a company called Oanda, which then kind of pioneered the retail space. We launched a trading platform there in 2001, paying second by second interest. And that was a kind of battle cry to change the back end of the financial system and offering the same narrow spread for the man in the street as the hedge fund manager. And in 2015, I launched Luke, which is a kind of a Wanda 2.0, trying to bring and leverage blockchain to really innovate financial markets. All right. So I'm a, I want to get into a little bit of the history here just before we move on to the technology. Can you explain, uh, a lot of our audience is retail traders. Could you explain to them what life was like before the real time, the real time information system? And then what the real-time information system did uh, for the markets and for giving access to, to the FX markets? I mean, first of all, it starts off that very way back, the man in the street didn't ever talk about financial markets. It was a pure insider club. And the insider club, they made money. And everyone knew that information is key. So, you know, kind of the Rothschilds had kind of doves, which would give them early news of what would happen and they would place their bets on the markets. And in the modern technology, when the first telephone companies kind of appeared and was thing, the bankers would give special chocolate presents to the lady at the exchange to ensure that they get a false connection to the Milano exchange and could arbitrage the markets. So as markets became more sophisticated, being a successful trader or asset manager, it's all about information. And for a long period of time in banks, you know, everyone knew that basically if I shuffle the cards, the croupier can keep a little more of the money. And obviously the regulators has come in and said, you know, that's bad business practice. You should clean up the shop. But because the players, you know, kind of keep the secret themselves, the regulators don't really know what to look for. So What has happened is the man in the street or the professional trader has a very superficial idea of how markets work. And it's the trader who has the detailed knowledge. And and just to kind of touch on this, the real-time information system made it so that the the retail trader on the street had access to the same information as the big funds? Yes, this is what he thinks. This is what he thinks. Actually, it takes a lot more knowledge then, you know, kind of, then one thinks. Today, people, when they trade through Robinhood, they think they see a narrow spread, but, you know, they see any spread. And the retail trader is not even aware of how important the spread is, that the spread and the total costs of trading will dictate this p So there is a big lack of education for the man in the street of what is important and how to uh, make trading a success. I think that's going to be a big nature of our conversation is some of the things that retail traders don't pay attention to that are in the background subtly affecting their P&L. So really in trading or in investments, it's what you buy, when you buy it, and the fees that you pay. 
Do I have that correct? Yes. And actually, the fees are much more important than you'd ever think. So we're going to talk about a few ways that there's obvious fees and then maybe non-obvious fees in the background, like spread, that tr traders don't pay attention to. But first, I kind of want to go through your story first. Uh, High-frequency trading is one of the most commonly used strategies for large firms to have an advantage over the retail community. But you were pioneering the high-frequency trading space before it was even an industry, so pre-1999. pre, pre could you explain what led to the research in high frequency trading and how that led to your understanding of markets? So, I mean, very simple. My background, you know, in the family, lots of people were physicists and natural scientists. And there it's very simple. You start when you do research, you start with the nitty gritty detail. And so for me, it was natural financial markets. If I want to better understand it, let's start to collect tick by tick data. And then you notice, oh, there are spikes you know, kind of the bid and ask, oh, there are different quotes, you know, who provides the quote, there's latency. So the complexity of what a price is, I learned over time. Well, from what you learned in that period, what, what could you explain to the retail trader of what price is? First of all, I think the most important, the concept of price is a, a radical simplification. There is a buyer's price or a seller's price. These are two different prices. And who is the seller and who is the buyer? And depending who they are, the price levels are different. So price itself is just one thing, but it depends, am I buying at the buyer's price or at the seller's price? And depending on what's, how I implement my strategy, I can save cost. Going, this is a little bit off topic here, or on topic, but a little bit off uh, chronology here. If... Do you believe that since you started this research or since you started in this industry till now, do we have more accurate price discovery today or less accurate price discovery? In absolute terms, it's much more accurate. Because when I started, you know, kind of, we had a famous researcher, he and his wife would record the prices manually, literally. They were looking at the screens and typing it and writing it down. So in that sense, it has much improved. But in relative terms, when you look at second by second and price jumps, actually things haven't improved. The, the price spikes have become even worse. And okay. if I lose within a, a half a second, 0.1%, but annualize this 0.1%, then that's like 10,000% loss. Could you explain to a retail trader that has no experience in the institutional systems that that make up these transactions, but they only interact with the market on a superficial level. Could you explain to them why these inaccuracies in price happen? Could you explain why spikes happen or why brokerages have, um, I don't want to call it mis inaccurate pricing, but maybe it's not accurate price discovery? So, I mean, it starts, and here I'm politically incorrect. It's like going to a doctor or you go to a supplier. Is your supplier sincere or not? Does he play to his cards or to your cards? So many players out there are just there to maximize profits. So, and obviously there are lots of tricks which can be played and there are being played. And the end guy pays, the guy in the streets pays for it. You have to choose as a retail trader, choose a reliable platform where people have some, you know, kind of other objectives or they're really trying to build a serious platform and then you'll be well served. If a retail trader is watching this and they're asking themselves, what characteristics should I be looking for uh, in a reputable exchange or a reputable brokerage or a reputable in any intermediary uh, to interact with? What are the characteristics that they should be looking for? First, I'm saying something. His gut feeling is very important. I mean, you know, that's just like when you choose a restaurant, you have a good feel, yes or no. The second thing is like what I'm trying, I'm always trying to eat my own dog's food. On our exchange, for example, we don't charge bid and ask fees uh, by a taker or maker fees. And for clear purpose, we want to make it simple for the end user. And in that sense, you know, kind of, I think there is no absolute recipe. It's he has to just try to make a very superficial judgment. And that judgment, I think, it, you know, goes longer and is more valuable than we think. Okay. No, that's very fair. I was I was kind of looking more so, and I guess these are just basics that everyone is looking for, 
A trader is looking for a liquid market. A trader is looking for low fees. But in terms of to, in today's market with the way that things are, what should a trader be looking for in terms of their brokerage? Is it the low fees? Is it commission versus spread? How should they be thinking about those things? It, it basically, I mean, kind of like commission and fees, they belong together. So, you know, kind of, uh, so uh, fees and spread, I'm kind of, you have to look at it both together. So he has to look at the whole package. Like if, for example, the kind of rates which you get when you kind of or onboarding, offboarding, I mean, it's the whole package. And at the last but not least, does he feel comfortable when you use this, the tools? Okay. So it's very just user, user experience oriented? User experience. And... I think the only thing, I mean, the, why I want to emphasize the fee and the spread part of the equation is any professional, you know, he just, a professional doesn't just open a position. He manages a position over time to get rid of this kind of risk of just, you know, at the snap of a second, I open a position, but maybe I was too rash. I want to lower and increase exposure over time to manage, you know, kind of when, the price has moved up too fast. I kind of reduce exposure. I try to build it up again. And there, if you kind of think about it, that involves additional trading. And when you have to pay for additional trading, the fee which you're charged is very important. Hmm. So if, for example, you're charged just 0.1% more, then if you have to do 10 trades, then it's 10 times 0.1%. It's 1%. And if you do this once a day and, you know, kind of 200 times a year, you know, that just adds up. It's 20% performance. This is just a curiosity question. Is the fee more important to the institutional trader who's doing thousands or millions of transactions? Or is it more important to the retail trader where every percentage on his profit or loss counts and the fees can work against him? Or is it for everybody? It's for everyone. I mean, first of all, the kind of institutional trader, even more so, he's also, I mean, you know, kind of it's if he has 2% or 5%, that's a world of difference in terms of performance. So it's just applies for everyone. Okay. Now let's get back to the timeline. I'm very interested on how your research led to Olson and Associates, how Olson and Associates led to, I don't say the discovery, but really the pioneering of high frequency trading. And then how that transitioned over into Oanda, uh, into the currency converter, which was kind of like the first big major project. Mm -hmm. um, could you walk through the transition from Olson and Associates to Oanda? So first, in my first job in a bank, I was hired as a data typist after having a PhD. And then, you know, I was used to print out graphs from, uh, at the time, data stream had a big database and, you know, people would come to me and ask for printouts. And I had to do that. And out of that, the first idea was born of building a real-time information system with real-time forecasts. And, you know, I could tell you of all the setbacks which we had in building that platform and, you know, getting our 60 customers across, Let's hear the, a few. you know. I'd love to hear a few of the setbacks and how you worked against them. I mean, first, I mean, the first, and, and actually these setbacks, which kind of were stumbling blocks for us at the time, are still today, people are not aware of that. I mean, if they would build the systems, they would still run into the same setbacks. So a key problem was that after the first month, our forecast would look always in the same direction. And the, and the big trader, you know, he, I still remember, he told him, you know, the only thing which I, if I want to change the forecast, I have to turn the screen around. <laughs> okay. So the real-time information system, that was revolutionary just in terms of getting access to markets, where did the currency converter come in? How did that- So idea? at the time, so, so that was in 95, we were selling for half a million tick data to a UBS, the big banks. And the internet started to, you know, kind of come out and we said, look, let's make data available for free on, on the internet. And this is how the currency converter was started. Uh, what year was this? 95, 1995. So I'm very old. Okay. Well, I just want folks to understand how early of a pioneer you were in this space. So the internet was just coming out and you weren't trying to build an online retail agency or anything like that. What you were doing is focusing uh, on... Oh. 
Okay. I mean, we were we were we were trying. I mean, kind of we had been building the real time information system, and it was running with big banks, and we tried to you know popularize that and give internet access early versions. Uh, okay, well that's that's fair. I'm, <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe I feel like I'm focusing too much on the ones that were successes rather than all the different trials you had to go through to find the successful companies. So out of the different, tr the different projects that you tried, which ones did you think were going to be successful? And then did you expect that the currency converter, for example, would be such a big hit? Um, I mean, first of all, uh, I, I would argue all, many of the projects which I've started, even though they were not successful at the time, can still be huge successes. Like even today, a real-time information system with real-time forecasts for financial markets doesn't exist. Could you explain to people why it doesn't exist? What is so difficult about building a global real-time information system? First of all, tell me why should it be so difficult? I don't know. I mean, obviously it takes data, it takes work, et cetera. But why people haven't built it, I'm completely puzzled. So when I meet people in central banks, I still see them kind of aggregating numbers of Excel spreadsheets and trying to get to an analysis of what's going on. I mean, this is just stupid. It's amateur. And I don't have an answer why people don't do it. Is it education? Because from what I've seen, you've been so um, ahead of the curve on the blockchain revolution that your understanding of decentralized systems is a little bit more advanced than let's say someone who strictly studied history or philosophy about economics, like an economist. So do you feel like your advantage is in how early you were in the blockchain space? Or what do you feel like the advantage is? I mean, I mean, of course, I mean, kind of, I've got really my hands dirty at all levels. So that is an immense experience. So because I have done that, you know, kind of, I, I just, you know, I, I've, I've burnt my fingers many times over and, and nothing concentrates the mind as much as if you're kind of really under threat. That makes sense. What was your first exposure to blockchain? And then what was your immediate um, thought process after you got exposed? So, so first of all, I was very slow to understand it because so just imagine. So we set up on a huge success with this kind of goal of revamping the backbone of the financial industry. So when Bitcoin first, uh, you know, kind of one talked about it, I didn't understand why does a guy want to have one currency? My view was more the world has to have an infinite number of currencies to make it stable. So first I, I was like that. And it's only in 2011 that I suddenly realized, my goodness, I can use the backbone of this infrastructure to abuse it, quote unquote, to use it as the backbone for this new kind of uh, financial infrastructure. And I then tried to convince the board of Oanda to embrace that. Beginning of 2012 really made it, tried a serious effort, but didn't have a chance. See, it's, it's crazy when you say that you're slow to understanding it, but you're developing this stuff in 2012, which arguably is like the first inception of Bitcoin uh, that really that really took off. Uh, yes, and and obviously these, you know, the protocols didn't exist at the time. So it, it was in that sense pioneering, I agree. Um, were you we're more sorry? Were you more impre impressed with, or were you more like looking at this technology as currency, or did you automatically start to notice the smart contract aspect? Where no, you can smart contract is the most. That's the most interesting, and and I mean, kind of, you know, the blockchain and smart contract, and we're at such infancy. I mean, just to understand the kind of revolution which we still have to. Uh, take and the leap which we have to take, you have to kind of cycle back to when the Romans invented Roman law. Because just imagine at the time they didn't have printing press, they didn't have typewriters and nothing. But if you go and just Google uh, the kind of uh, Roman law and see the thickness of the book of the full legal code which they had developed, just imagine, they did it at a time when they did, had no tools available. So if we now want to reinvent our legal system, which is which the content, which smart contracts are about, we have to do a transformative work. That's a, that's a very, very interesting point because it goes to this idea that financial technologists today, they're wrestling more with philosophical questions than they are maybe even technology questions. Maybe the, the technology exists but the framework to make a decision about how the e ecosystem should run 
that's a problem that people are dealing with. Do you have a framework for how you think about the philosophical side of finance that helps you make decisions? Oh, yeah, I would say, of course. <laughs> so so the, the essence of my work is actually to rethink about economics in general. And there I've developed a kind of relativity theory of economics. And it, that is, and the thought processes which are involved, that's for me the inspiration. Could you share? A few of those uh, kinds of things that you've learned. Yes, so so very important. I mean, kind of in the physicists who have kind of developed the foundations of modern physics, relativity, quantum theory, they have never kind of used the same concepts to understand human behavior, economic behavior, and the big problem in economics, as you speak it today, is just you take an equation of an economist where he, you know, for the GDP, he says it's composed of consumption, investment, you just add up these terms, and then you get to the GDP. But you know from physics, your basic school physics, that if you don't get the meters and centimeters right, you, 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 you fail the exam. So economics has never thought about units. So how come? So a lot of people, when they think about economics, they think it's predominantly math based. But what, um, from my experience, I think it's more uh, social, behavioral based. Is it like, ha has this been, ha why is economics not seen as a science, as opposed to a social science? I mean, there are a number of factors. First, the history is short, and people have not understood that we have today an abundance of data because it's an abundance of data, just because of that, you can look at it in, as a natural si science subject. But what, what's important is you have to go at it with new ideas. It's not about just taking concepts of physics and mapping them one-to-one. -one. They have to be reinvented. From researching you, I learned that the idea of the real-time information system kind of came from the idea of uh, having the weather uh, information system that came out. How... Uh -huh important was studying that and studying the physics of weather patterns that are very unpredictable how did you relate that to markets i mean first of all i mean i mean the weather forecast i mean it's a huge success story you know when i was young everyone laughed about weather forecasts but today you know you plan your walks according to weather forecasts so it's, it's, it's so it's a huge success story and at least in Switzerland, where the weather can be very jumpy because you have the, the Alps and, you know, come sometimes good weather, sometimes bad. If you can do that, why not do the same thing in financial markets? And especially there, there is a person called Benoit Mandelbrot who developed uh, fractal theory. And his work has been very inspirational. Could you talk about that key piece of insight that you took from his research that kickstarted uh, your Kind of your journey uh, or it kind of it was like a backbone of your research yeah so i mean kind of first of all i think the most important of mandelbrot says when you look at a phenomenon try to look at it at many different scales don't just look at one scale but try to look at many different scales and then try to discover scaling laws are consistent properties and with financial market prices which are fractal in property obviously that's super relevant no. So it was really just kind of relating financial markets to nature and understanding yes. the imperfection? Of course. And, and what I miss today is when we think of how to organize a society, why not just embrace nature? We're part of nature. So embrace the concepts of nature and how we kind of want to find solutions. I'm going to jump straight to uh, the, high, the highest level question, which is how can the incentives be restructured so that the financial system can operate more naturally as opposed to allowing so many individual actors to interfere with the system. Did that question make sense? Yes. So obviously, uh, this is a tough problem to solve. And the, uh, so to give an analogy, as long as the territory is very flat, there are lots of, you know, small local lakes, etc., which develop. If there is a kind of slope, then, you know, you can introduce order. So in my view, and this is why I'm focusing on building a company is, you know, I could either just 
try to write down books and, and you know, kind of do talks, etc., to try to convince the people of what to do. But I think that's hopeless. So what I'm trying to do is just build a successful business. And by building a successful business, I can, you know, set a standard, forcing the others to adopt. And Wanda, in a certain sense, succeeded that. We went in as a white knight, said, look, let's try to clean up the place. So we came up with better standards, forcing everyone else to adopt better standards. Now, I would have loved to be more aggressive and continue more, but this is why I'm doing Wiccan. For sure. As a large company grows, they tend to become more conservative because they don't want to lose what they have. And I'm very interested to get into the discussion of Luke and what you're doing now, because all of your ideas are basically being transcribed into a real company and it's experiments that are being run in real time. So I'm very interested in that. But to touch on the Oanda, Oanda really was a revolutionary company. Could you explain to the retail trader that's very young that maybe just expo got exposed to retail trading three to five years ago, how influential was Oanda and what did Oanda do that was so revolutionary in the industry? I mean, first of all, uh, at the time, people who... I mean, first of all, one has to explain foreign exchange. Why is foreign exchange attractive? Because foreign exchange always move and you can earn when markets go up and when they go down. That's point one. The second is at the time, the costs of trading foreign exchange were huge. The retail trader had to pay something like a half a percent or one percent to open a position. So he would only be able to make a profit if the price would move by two percent. So by launching Honda with a very nice user interface, very simple, suddenly there it was, people could first trade with a spread of 0.1%. And then over time, we lowered it to kind of one pip, which is today standard. But we were obviously far ahead. And, you know, people who were hamburger flippers who suddenly used the service. And at the same time, top traders in Citibank Deutsche Bank, which were you also using. Could you describe how the technology then kind of converged? Did the institutional side study the technology and create their own universe? And did the retail crowd evolve from that? Or are we still using the same concepts that you develop today? I mean, it's more or less the same concepts. I mean, you know, nothing much has happened. I mean, you know, kind of like something which I continuously uh, have been talking about for over 20 years is like, the yield curve, as it stands today, starts with one day interest and then up to one year. But we should have an intraday yield curve that you can loan out money for a half an hour, two hours, four hours. And if a Lehman Brothers needs cash urgently, you can give it money for three hours at an interest of 100% annualized, 1,000%. The way that payments are done between banks today? Is it a technology issue? Is it a regulatory issue? Is it a legacy infrastructure? They already have their own game. They don't want to ruin it. What is the biggest hurdle today for creating a real-time payment system interbank or just between people? Uh, it's, I mean, kind of, you know, cannibalizing my franchise. That's point one. <laughs> Second is, you know, just people are lazy. Uh, third, third is uh, at universities, the universities don't have access to real data. Real-time trading is not part of the curriculum. So it's just we're in an age, you know, kind of pre-industrialization. And, you know, from pre-industrialization to this more modern age, it's just very slow. When you got some of the largest banks in Europe on board with Oanda, what, what was it that made that so successful? Because the idea of getting a lot of the large banks on board with a project is a dream for a lot of people. What did they see? Was it the technology? Was it the innovation? What was it that made them get on I board? I mean, uh, just if you're passionate and, you know, are honest, but not, you know, kind of just let's be sincere. And people are very open because in lots of the big banks, the people want to do relevant projects. It's not that they don't want, but they're just, as always, lots of obstacles. You can get this wrong and that wrong, and that's always daunting. Okay. I do want to bring this conversation back to earth for the retail traders at home. If there is an 18-year-old Richard Olson out there that wants to get into financial markets because people are getting rich on NFTs, people are getting rich uh, buying random cryptocurrencies, what advice would you give to a young Richard Olson 
about getting into financial markets today? I mean, first, uh, get your hands dirty, point one, do whatever you think. I mean, first, uh, become a bot trader. That's point one. But also do solid science. And then go to people who are kind. Try to work together. Be, help someone to be, you know, volunteer at a place. Just, uh, you know, just to get exposure. Okay. So the experience part is really important. But I want you to dive deeper on the bot trader. What do you what do you mean by that exactly? So I mean, kind of a bot trader is um, in a bot, you compress in a very simple form what you know about this data series. And if the bot loses money, you can say, by the way, I don't know such a lot about that same data series. But if your bot makes money, then that's a very good metric to understand how much you understand. So the bot is a very, it's like, you know, kind of when you have to learn physics and you build your first small, simple car, if the car always breaks down, then it's clear, maybe you should learn a little more about physics. And the same thing is with bot traders. It's a good measure of your understanding. Okay. So if someone, is it possible, and I guess this is a very general question, but through your experience with Oanda, is it possible for a retail trader to be successful without a quantitative edge, without looking at their results, without mapping out their edge? Or is it possible to do like a manual, you know, they have a step-by-step -step manual system that they adhere to? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, but it's very important. I mean, first of all, it's, it's, it's super tough, and I have to say. The second thing is he has to understand, and I think, unfortunately, kind of the work which we have done is, is kind of not simple enough. It's he has to understand this event-driven approach and the kind of overshoots which happen and, you know, these scaling laws about overshoots. That's a, a huge help. And then so, so that he has to understand. And the second thing is what he has to understand as well is that the markets themselves are highly liquid, highly liquid, and can be much more overshooting than you'd ever guess. I think a lot of traders are going to experience uh, what liquidity really means this year <laughs> when they try to sell off some of these speculative assets and there's no one on the other side. But when you're talking about event-driven pricing, could you explain to folks in, in, in your mind, what is the flow of event to price? So first of all, I mean, the most important part of the flow is just an order, which is in the market, point one. So order, limit order, whatever it is, that's point one. But second, what's very important, that there is a force in the market, which goes opposite to the fundamentals. So let me explain. So obviously, fundamentals are the driving force of what, how people allocate their assets. So you'll have bigger positions in favor of the fundamentals. But here's now the catch. Because we human beings are very bad at estimating the tail event. You can measure that when glass falls to the ground, try to guess what is the glass splinter furthest away. You think, oh, within no half a meter. No, after a few days, you discover, oh, over there, three meters away, there was another glass splinter. So in the same way, price overshoots are bigger than you'd expect. So what happens in markets where people think the fundamentals are, you have a random overshoot in the opposite direction. And then people have to liquidate their positions, which they have opened according to the fundamentals, driving the price away from the fundamentals. So the market participants, which were trading in line with the fundamentals, are losing their assets on a counter spike. So so the perverse thing happens that the, if you have two camps, the camps which trade in favor of the fundamentals and the non-fundamental traders, the camp of the fundamentals, the army there is being decimated. So the price then goes on a trajectory opposite to the fundamentals. And that's a very important lesson to, to, to be aware of. Incredibly important. That is incredibly important. Now, when the markets eventually go back in the direction of the fundamentals, you know, let's, let's assume that that market is efficient and it eventually goes back in the direction. Why does it go back in the direction? Is it the individuals that were betting against the market now go on the other side of that position? Or uh, first I have to, I have to say it might last years before the price goes back into the fundamentals. Okay. So what I'm noticing now, because I mostly trade uh, U.S. equities, and with U.S. equities, there might be a fundamental event, let's say an interest rate news 
uh, interest rate news that we're raising interest rates three times this year, which is incredibly mm-hmm. bearish for the equity markets. But then we'll have a bullish spike. But then after the bullish spike, let's say a week and a half or two weeks later, then we have a continuation of the bearish trend mm-hmm. because uh, interest, interest rate rises are uh, inherently bearish for the markets. So in the short term, there was a bullish move that drove all of the sellers out of the market, the ones who were trading along with the fundamentals. But then two weeks later, it eventually ends up coming back down. Is there, is there a specific reason for that? Or is it just eventually the information is back in real time and everybody sees the landscape? And they so, trade. so first of all, I, I would uh, would argue there it's much. I mean, it's easy to to uh, write a story which somehow makes sense, but that is not the story which is actually unfolding. So, uh, I mean, it's very interesting. So I've done a lot of research there. So it's clear that we hear a storyline which you know, somehow resonates, but it will be nothing what really drives the market. I'm very, I'm very aware of that. <laughs> so what is what is happening there? Is it mis miseducation? Because if you learn something in school, for example, and you come out and you realize it doesn't work, is there something wrong with the way that we understand financial markets from an academic sense? Or, for example, if someone says that interest rate hikes because of the lack of liquidity in the markets is inherently bearish for equities because people sell off their equities for cash. Now, that sounds like a good story, but is it because our understanding of these mechanics is wrong or is it because the market dynamics today are shifting? No, because we haven't yet done our homework. I mean, the, you know, if you go to a doctor and he tries to whatever ailment you have, he, you know, it's, it's a complex story. Now, financial markets is really complicated. The whole tectonics of positions, etc. And we haven't done the homework. So we have to he- heavily invest in data analytics. And that work hasn't been done to my, I mean, it's such a pain for, so it's, you know, kind of like it's, I mean, just think of the geological composition of, of, of land, you know, all these different layers. And the same thing has to be done in financial markets. You have the long-term, short-term traders, their kind of positions overlap. And there is kind of this weather cartography of financial markets this has to be done as, and it's just hard work. Specifically, and from your experience with Oanda and Luke, what is the information disconnect? So what information do the institutional players have that retail doesn't have access to today? I mean, first of all, uh, the institutional players have much more experience. They're much more seasoned and they have to have indices according uh, which they have to beat. So that makes their problem kind of more tangible and easier, and they have colleagues to talk about. In the retail space, you don't have the right reference points, and you have these much too high fees, and you're surrounded with people and uh, parties who just want to screw you over. So it's very tough. Let's move over to what to your new to your work recently. So the Luke Group, it's L Y K K E for the folks at home. It's Basically, all the problems that you saw in the financial industry and some of the solutions that you had developed over the years, you're trying to implement into what I understand to be a wallet exchange kind of mix. Mix. Could you explain to people what Luke is? Uh, so Luke is a uh, very ambitious project where we have just completed phase one and we're gradually now opening phase two. At the core of Luke is market making, providing liquidity and earning money from providing liquidity. And when we mean liquidity, it means offer our customers a narrow bid and ask spread where we they can be either buyer or seller, and we manage that exposure and earn some money on it. And that's at the core. And I'm only doing this because I a lot of folks at home really, I feel like there's a, a lack of miseducation or a lack of education in this space. Before market making, could you explain how orders were sent through or how orders were organized? So uh, typically, you originally have an exchange, and there in the old world, you had open outcry. So it's a club of people who had access to the market, and the small group of people who had access to the market had certain kind of obligations. And this obligation included to be ready to be a buyer and seller at the same time for certain instruments. That's the original, how a market originally started. Mm -hmm. And 
then what happened is these institutions kind of ring fenced that right and generated unfair returns. And then what happened is the regulator said, you have to open up, you have to enable the other out guy to come in. But now we're somewhere mid of that process. So the retail guy is allowed to come in because there are certain marketplaces where he can also put in a bid and an ask and be a market maker, but he's poorly educated. From this is also a little bit more curiosity for history. Where did electronically con controlled networks come in? Or when did they come in? Uh, pretty early in the, you know, kind of the first ones uh, were in 87, 88, 89. Uh, this is when it started. Okay. I'm just trying to understand the chronology of how this technology developed because a lot of this technology that we use today is kind of sold to us. And I'm, I'm only speaking as myself as a retail trader and what I'm being promoted and what I'm being advertised. A lot of people are advertising this technology as if it was new when really it's been around for almost 20 or 30 years. So I really want folks to understand what you're doing and how pioneering it is today and how it's going to be even more relevant in three to five years. So if we can go back to the Luke discussion, what makes Luke today different than other wallets and exchanges? So we're not in the business of charging fees. We take on ourselves the difficult task of trying to make money from the flow. We're a market maker. We take risks and based on that risk, we earn. And by taking that risk, we offer an attractive product that is narrow bid and all spreads. So when people come to our place, they know that we're trying to provide the services as cheaply as possible. So we're in a sense, the IKEA of the financial industry on a micro scale, just starting off. Liquidity providers have gotten a bit of a bad rap. And you mentioned Robinhood earlier, because of the Robinhood fiasco, there's been a, a light shined on some really what I what I used to think of as just very normal business practices, which is the sale of order flow information. What is your opinion on that? That and, and how the public received that, the finding out that and there was payment for order flow. It's, of course, you know, kind of, it's a complex value chain. And if people just rip other people off, that doesn't shed a good light at all. But if it's done in a fair way, then it can be done. So it's like modern technology of, of offers more optionality, more things can be done. And obviously, it kind of is open to abuse. So therefore, at the end of the day, it's the people who run the business, which is so important. I don't want to get myself in trouble here. What is the appropriate way to handle order flow information from an institutional oh, uh, So to be fair on both sides, you don't, I mean, kind of what cannot be if you see a big order in the market, you just skew the price up to trigger that. I mean, that doesn't work. So don't abuse private information. And I mean, kind of in medicine, there was kind of in early days, you know, kind of a medical student had to kind of uh, 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 do the Hippocratic Oath. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the same kind of oath which any operator in financial markets should kind of abide by. After the 2008 financial crisis, did your opinion on trusting individuals to uphold their oath change? Or do you still believe that we can have a regulatory system that relies on trust and faith? I mean, first of all, I don't trust myself. You know, I know who I was when I'm dead, you know, uh, to, to be wrong. So I don't trust anyone. But whatever we do, it relies on trust, you know. So in a distributed system, we build on trust of many individuals and then it becomes more stable. But the more science driven, the more data driven, the more smart contract driven it is, the more fair it will become. So it's just a matter matter of starting to clean up the small things and then the big thing will kind of sort itself out as well. Okay. Do you think that the future of regulatory frameworks, the future of decision making is going to be like kind of blockchain based, smart contract based? Or do you think that there's some areas in, in life are, are always going to be intuitive decisions? So, I mean, kind of you have to embrace both. So it's like the yin and yang principle. You have to embrace to each other completely kind of... Uh, opposite principles. So on the one hand, science, rational, and the is in spontaneous. Boom, do it. Well, that makes that okay. That makes a ton of sense. I did want to get your opinion on some hot topics today in retail FX trading that just to see if um, what you think about some of these trends. One of them is the rise of proprietary trading. So firms that will allow people to take funding challenges and then fund a retail trader, a $50,000 account, $100,000, $200,000 account, and that trader can generate profits and share in the profits of the account. What do you think about the modern, like this rise of uh, prop firm trading? I mean, kind of, uh, if it were done in a very serious way, I, I would love it. But, uh, but like this, as it's being done, people are just being burned. I mean, it's painful for me to 
watch. What do you mean getting burned? I mean, kind of like, so the people think that it's really this gut feeling of a trader, which makes the, all the difference. And, and it's like sports people, which are being abused to try to perform to excel. So they burn out and doing that task. But if it were actually enabled for quant shops to do serious algorithmic trading, then that can be a very good approach. Okay. I'm hearing a very big theme here about information about your trading and quantifying the things that work versus the things that don't work in order to have any chance in these markets. And so it keeps going back to this question of can a trader succeed today manually or in order to have a, an even playing field, do they need to be trading, you know, algorithmically or using some kind of quantitative strategy? I mean, first of all, the existing quantitative strategies are very poor. So, you know, kind of it's 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 still a kind of very primitive environment. Um, and obviously, if, if a person has a good kind of self-awareness and well-balanced, he can trade very successfully but even much more successfully if he has the right support tools. For a retail trader, how is how does Luke give them an advantage in trading assets, ownership of assets, uh, owning uh, trading one specific asset for another? What kind of advantage does the Luke exchange or the wallet give them? I mean, first of all, you know, kind of I'm very, you know, not happy at all where we stand. But what we do today offer is in the industry, the narrowest spreads in the industry, if you account for full, full trading costs of you don't have maker uh, taker fees, which makes it very simple. So you can just put an order and you know it will you'll be executed at a fair price. So I think that's a small achievement, but an important achievement. That's huge. That's very huge. Is is the reason that people aren't working on innovating these technologies mostly because it's just hard work? Like I'm I'm sensing that there's a lot of hurdles in actually bringing this technology to life. Uh, is that, do you think that it's really just laziness from most people? I mean, laziness is such a, so rude. I mean, if, if people had the true vision of what could be built, then, you know, laziness would immediately disappear. But so if you, if you don't see the end of the tunnel of that, you know, kind of, there is a real possibility of re-engineering finance, then you think, oh, it's, you know, kind of, I'm anyway here for a limited period of time. So let's kind of milk cow as much as we can for the time being. So if you suddenly realize we're at the start of a new technology way, which will go infinitely long, you can afford to kind of, you know, just innovate. Imagine you had a, you have a genie wish and Luke is going to come out exactly as envisioned. What does the future look like with a successful Luke? Let's just have a sustainable economic system, you know, which the economic system, which is a nervous system, can really efficiently transmit the information complex information which we have to share around the globe to coordinate ourselves and make sure that the world is sustainable. In five years, if I have a Luke wallet, what sorts of assets will I be able to buy that don't exist today? Uh, 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 99% of the assets will, <laughs> will all be new. So <laughs> it's incredible how many new assets will be generally created in the coming years. What? Hold on. That's, that's probably the biggest, most important thing you said all interview. What is? What do you mean that 99% of the assets that are going to exist in the future don't exist today? I mean, first of all, every company will have its own utility coins and not just one utility coin and a huge number of coupons which empower you and give you rights to do things. So we're at the brink of an experience explosion in terms of new financial instruments, which are all micro incentives to do certain things. How does this differ from the current financial system, which one of the issues that if you talk to economists, they say that it's become so convoluted that it's hard to unwind some of these things. So like the invention of all of these derivative contracts that led to the 08 crisis was because they were so complex, the market participants couldn't really understand the collateral, like what was happening in the background. And it led to a lot of hype and and some of those disastrous consequences. Do you see the assets of the future being different? I mean, first of all, uh, I mean, the old world, 2008, were Excel spreadsheets on top of Excel spreadsheets, which were not maintained. So it's clear that it's very hard to keep track of Excel spreadsheets, which don't have a consistent data form. The new world, every asset is a currency. So you don't, by definition, you know, with each asset, you're already at floor zero. You don't build on top of anything. So that's point one. 
The second is key of such a new financial system is a comprehensive information system, a big data information system where equivalent to Wikipedia, which you have for keywords, you have a Wikipedia in real time for all these instruments with real time forecasts. So this is a completely different world. Do we have the technology today to be able to provide that real time information? If we work. Okay, that's a great answer. Um, you mentioned a few years ago, and I think this was more than a few years ago. This is a very interesting topic that got my mind working, which is the having uh, employment contracts having an intrinsic value and then being tradable contracts. And then you said that if this was if this concept was understood and accepted, then we could uh, we could face the employment problem. How does in a, an employment contract having intrinsic value impact the employment dynamic? I mean, first of all, it's interesting. I'm just mentioning that was the first true insight which I had in my career. And that made me aware, my goodness, if, I mean, it's very simple. It gave me idea. goosebumps. When I, when I heard you say it on the, on YouTube, I was listening and I was like, what did he just say? I had to rewind it a few times. I, I really couldn't wrap my head around it, which is why I need uh, I need your so, so just to explain. So when you have a, sh you're hired short term to be a kind of seasonal labor, the, the guy who employs you says, okay, I can earn this amount of money and I'll just pay you so, so much. But over time, and this has happened in Europe and some other countries, the employment contracts were extended and extended. So when you hire someone in France, you know, you'll have him hired for many, many years. But when you hire him and the price of the salary which you give is fixed, then it's suddenly like a financial instrument with a thick, like a bond, paying you a certain yield. An 8% bond for eight years is an eight year bond. And if interest rate levels go to 1%, obviously the price of the bond appreciates. So in analogy, that has happened and is happening with jobs. Now, everything is obfuscated because, you know, people say, oh, it's human beings, et cetera. And each individual employment relationship is different. But the HR departments make it clear. No, kind of, you know, employees, employee one, two or three are all the same. They're treated according to kind of standard rule books. So what I argue for, is as opposed to having people who are unemployed not know what you do with them and you pay them unemployment benefits, people should be allowed to capitalize their unemployment benefits. You go to an unemployment office, say, give me eight months of unemployment money, and then you turn around and come to the startup and say, look, damn it, I'll bring you X dollars and help you build the business. Or if someone builds a factory, he can sell his jobs and get investment plus you know, bank funding to fund the factory. So this might seem like a an like an outlandish idea for a lot of people that are listening, but the example that you used when you were explaining this was the or, the origin of property, how property mm -hmm. was the original employment contract that then became tradable. Mm -hmm. If we give or if we recognize intrinsic value in an employment contract, will we one day be able to trade employment contracts and hedge of course employment? Of course. Of course that will happen. And but the interesting thing is as that happens, the employees in the factory will suddenly see, ah, oh, look, if we make sure the factory operates very well, then their employment contracts will increase in value. That's so fascinating to me. There's so many different directions I want to go. Um I want to I want to touch on this assets of the future thing. So are, is every asset that we currently have today going to be done differently? Let's say ownership of property, ownership of intellectual property. Is that all going to be digitalized, tokenized on a blockchain for record? How is the future of these assets going to be? The, the assets that of we course. currently hold? Uh, of course, every legal right, whatever it be, will be tokenized. And the reason why that is so much more efficient is because the paperwork surrounding those rights are radically simplified. And even more important, you can incrementalize it. You can sell fractions of it. So if you have litter in the street, you have a bot, you know, kind of cleaning the street and earns a fraction of a cent to get rid of all the litter per per item which it collects. This is insane. Um, does the Luke model of having a wallet exchange real-time information system, does this disrupt banking? Do banks still have a place if you can get collateral, if you can get lending from a decentralized uh, institution instead? I mean, look, what is a bank about? A bank is, you know, a localization organization. And they'll, whatever we do, it has to be localized. And that, that leaves a lot of room for banks. So, so we have a strong partnership strategy where we have a look at business, where we try to empower uh, organizations to embrace the new technology. Okay. And... <laughs> And I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but if they don't embrace the technology, eventually the consumers are going to pick whichever is the most efficient for them, right? Of and course. so if the onboarding happens 
to these new exchanges and new wallets and new technologies, how does that affect the banking system? Of course, I mean, they'll be under threat and you lose a lot of business. I mean, it's off, it's clear. I mean, it's the, you'll, they'll have the Kodak moment. And, you know, it's on the way to the Kodak moment, they can choose. Do I want to end there or kind of do I want to uh, be part of the new story, which is so exciting and contribute to a better world? It's a very, it's a great future to aim to. And I'm, I just want to say thank you. Because not a lot of, I know how hard this must be to create and find solutions for things that don't exist. So thank you for taking that step and doing that. Because I know not a lot of folks are, are going to step into that space. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm so, And I do want to pick your brain for 10 more minutes. I know I've, it kind of sounded like I was wrapping up. I have so many questions. I want to be mindful of your time, but I want to make sure I don't miss anything. So after this, okay. I'm not like, oh, I should have asked about this. When a, in, when a retail trader goes to input a trade today, and actually, let me ask a precursor question. Regulated versus unregulated Forex exchanges. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on whether one is superior to the other, whether it's just about using your judgment, like you said earlier, do you have an opinion on regulated versus unregulated? No, of course. I mean, many unregulated are just by definition really unregulated in the true sense of the word. So uh, they have to be looked at in more caution. My The reason I ask the question that way is when there's a legacy structure that, as you described, is fundamentally broken, there needs to be innovative players that are playing in a gray area to sort of create this innovative technology. Do you think that those unregulated institutions should lean heavier to regulation and work with regulators or to kind of operate in this gray area so they could push the boundaries of innovation? So it's a very tough question. I think it has to do with the nature of the founder. So it's a very personal question. Like, and if he is more of a revolutionary himself, please stay in the unregulated space. You'll never succeed in the regulated space. So it's, you know, just has to be, the decision is up to the guys who are cooking the soup. They have to decide which, and they want to, you know, on which part they want to err. Right. And the customers choose who, which soup to eat. That's, that's a very important one too. How many fees and what sorts of fees just so, the retail trader at home can understand what fees am I exposed to when I go to enter a position today in the foreign exchange market in a traditional brokerage? So obviously you have you have to bring the money to the place to the venue. That's point fee number one. You might have if you know depending you deposit your money, there might be charges there involved. You know how much will interest be paid? Yes or no. And secondly, there is the visible fee. That's the ticket fee which you're charged and the invisible fee in the sense the spreads which you pay. And the spreads will not be the same in all market conditions. So it may be that the broker offers me narrow spreads in normal conditions, but as soon as the markets are a little more volatile, he'll double the spreads of what is happening in the real market. Okay. So that's really important for folks to understand the visible versus the invisible. Because yes. um, when I said that we're advertised a lot of things as retail traders today, a broker might advertise himself as having very low commissions, but this, but they'll compensate with the spread. Or some folks yeah. might have very tight spread conditions, but they'll compensate with the commission to give you better entry and execution. Exactly. And if you're a big player, might play against you this one player in their ecosystem which has a big position so they'll skew the price to his disfavor because they know he's long and he has to sell so there's a myth in retail trading about market manipulation um liquidity hunts and things like that could you speak to that is there any truth to the the practices that brokerages use of course you know human beings are there human beings want to make money and you know there are so many subtle mechanisms which can be used that Yes, they're kind of being used, but also you have to also realize that many of the players don't have this kind of negative energy. Could you describe some of those subtle mechanisms that brokerages and other institutions have to be able to take advantage of price and uh, mar market participants? <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, it's, uh, first, if you have from inside of the market, you know that certain orders you know, have been placed at this level because you have talked to people or whoever, then obviously, if you know that there is a big order hanging there, this will affect either you want to try to trigger that order to get a big move and you put your big positions on so that you profit from that. So obviously, you know, people take advantage of opportunities and if they're there, they'll try to do it. Okay. I just wanted to hear it from you <laughs> because there's... um. The misinformation campaigns that brokerages use is that, no, no, it's the retail trader. If you lost a position, it's your fault. And so traders are constantly in a loop of thinking that they are 
solely responsible for some of these erroneous happenings in the market. You get a giant liquidity spike up, you get liquidated out of your position. And so they, they just, they tend to feel that frustration. But, but, but there I have to say, I mean, if the markets would be paying intraday interest, the spikes would kind of become much smaller. So this is a big, big misdesign of, of the system as it stands. What do you mean by intraday spreads? Like real-time information? Intraday or? interest rate payments. Okay. So if participants would earn money intraday for providing liquidity, then liquidity would not disappear so fast. Mm, okay. So the spikes are really just a liquidity problem? Yes. Okay, good to know. Um, a big, and we're, we're about to wrap up here. I really do appreciate your time. I have one more long form question, and then I want to get your take on some hot topics and then we're done. Is that cool? Yes. Okay, perfect. A big cornerstone of your philosophy is democratizing finance. The way that, you know, ever since I've been studying financial markets, I really haven't seen an example of a truly democratized system that has fair balance for everybody and that also promotes productivity and growth. So a lot of the places where you see a democratized, a truly democratized system, you see stagnation. Um, could you explain how a market can function in a democratized way? And do we need centralized systems to make the market function? I guess uh, a heavy handed uh, question. <laughs> no, so I, I mean, I would argue... Um with all its faults, modern technology has helped to kind of democratize a lot. So just competition of ideas, different ventures can get started. That creates enough pressure to kind of contribute to overall fairness. Now, that today's global abuse happens is because if we just had a few more general ideas of how to structure this emerging chaos, we could really make it a lot fairer. So, and, and if you think of it, I, I used IKEA as an example. I mean, in socialist countries, it was always said, look, let's make, enable people to live in nice environment. IKEA has made it possible. Today, with very little money, you can buy beautiful furniture. And that's, uh, that's a big achievement. Okay. So now, now I want to get your opinion on some topics today in the economy that may or may not be understood. Let's take inflation, for example. It's been a very big topic here in the States because uh, the Federal Reserve has shifted their focus from, you know, boosting in uh, price stability and boosting employment over to a new mandate where they're strictly focused on fighting inflation. So they believe that inflation has become too rampant and it's going to hurt the majority of the population. Do you believe that um, or what is your take on the, inf the inflation crisis today? And what do you feel like it's been fueled by? Uh, I mean, I mean, it's colossal mismanagement on our how governments, central banks have been managing the financial industry. I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, we're really so far off what I think is a healthy financial system that it's very hard to bring that back into equilibrium. Okay. So the, I guess the harder topic or the harder question would be, is it possible for us to create an off-ramp from one financial system to another, or does there need to be like the end of one cycle transition into the next cycle sort of pain? I think it wouldn't be necessary uh, if people were more open. And this is what I actually hoped at the beginning of 2015, that central bankers still had in memory, you know, the crisis 208, and let's embrace the opportunity and create, you know, a new financial system, which addresses the shortcomings. But what I'm so baffled with is, you know, First, no one understands, no one is ready to, you know, take the effort, but we have to go for out of the box answers, the existing recipe answers we've tried a thousand times. So now we have to think out of the box and why not get the best brains together? There we go. Um, NFTs, very hot topic mm -hmm. today. Uh, the idea obviously is something that you've uh, been talking about for years, which is just uh, like a global registry for specific assets. But this idea of combining art with non-fungibility and creating ecosystems around it, how are, how are you watching the space devolve, uh, evolve and where do you see the space going? I mean, first of all, it's great. I mean, like I, I think I so much admire the guys at OpenSea, just how they build a business. Uh, you know, it, it's so impressive, you know, you know, so that's point one. The second thing is I find it particularly fascinating because the traditional financial system is broke. And I could well imagine that in the NFT space, actually in this free floating, actually we'll have so much more innovation where actually the world will then suddenly embrace the NFT infrastructure as the infrastructure for the traditional financial instruments. What does the NFT space need to go from this profile picture of monkeys phase 
into something that's a lot more widely understood and widely accepted um, to be used for, like you said, anything that has virtual ownership. So how do we go from this phase to the next one? I mean, I, you know, and there again, you know, I have gotten it wrong. Uh, I have to admit, I mean, we have to embrace more of the ideas of Airbnb because Airbnb has also done a very good job at using social intelligence to use that as a kind of regulating mechanism of the kind of market space. And especially in NFT, that is an important part of the equation. So I would use social intelligence. I would use an information system as well. And then obviously a good scientific design of how I would design these NFT marketplaces. Wow, that's awesome. Um, what is building the engineering of some of what Oando, it's a huge, huge name today. And also Luke, what have you learned about markets from working on the engineering side of the financial system? I mean, first of all, I've been very lucky. I mean, just taking it Rwanda, I mean, kind of, it's like having an atomic reactor and seeing 50,000 traders trade in real time. I can first time understand what's really going on and suddenly realize that the textbook, texts are just wrong, you know? So just being able to see in my own eyes certain things, that was very inspirational. That's amazing. Um, what did you learn? And I don't, I don't want to get too deep into this because maybe there's some, there's some information here that you don't want to share. But what did you learn about retail trading habits from having access to all this information? That, so, uh, and specifically tips to somebody to keep them out of trouble. This is what I'm really trying to uh, So, So very important. I think the statement which I made, uh, which I tried to highlight, that be aware as a retail trader that the fundamentals can work against you because you'll be over optimistic on the fundamental side and don't take sufficient account of the kind of tail event, which creates a cascade, which goes in the opposite direction. So that's one of the most important lessons to keep in mind. Uh, keep high. Oh. And then the second thing is um, key to my work is what I call an intrinsic event time, event based. And what it tells you there is when the price goes up from a high, and it changes direction by a certain threshold, you know ex ante that when it has dropped by this threshold, that on average it will continue by another threshold. Okay. So what does that mean? If when you design your trading strategy, please put in a stop loss. When you hit the stop loss, get out because on average it will continue another price move of the same size. So that's a very important lesson. And tips in terms of leverage. I mean, first, don't get ahead of yourself. <laughs> Rome was not built in one day. So if you today have $5,000, be glad if you can increase that to $6,000. Don't go for $10,000. Okay. Um, holding versus securing profits along the way. So uh, accumulating all the money inside of a brokerage account to compound over time versus periodically taking money out of the market. Is it I mean, individual-based or is it is there something in the markets that's a trend that you see? No, it's a good discipline. So, you know, like put something aside for the, you know, kind of the rainy day. Okay. And spoil your wife or your partner. There we go. <laughs> Dr. Olson, could you tell the folks that you will indeed be a virtual speaker at the FX Summit 2022 in Miami? Yes. Looking forward to being a virtual speaker. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm very happy to have you on. Dr. Olson, thank you so much for an incredibly insightful conversation, very well informed, and so many different perspectives on philosophy, on technology, and on finance. Thank you for getting on the Chart Addicts podcast. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. All the best. Thanks. Goodbye.